hear this, but you are not crazy. I feel it too. Collectively, I'm feeling it. Everyone's feeling it. That slight discomfort, the feeling that something's not quite right. I feel it too. You're not crazy. And today, I'm actually going to be preaching a little bit off of my notes because I had a very specific message come through straight from the Lemurians and that's what I'm going to try to deliver today as cleanly as possible with what they said. So I was laying in my bed the other night and this actually all kind of started around that new moon in Aries. So March 9th-ish is kind of when all of this energy started and I was asleep in my bed and in the middle of the night, I felt the attack in my throat. I woke up coughing and choking. And you know, this only happened to me one time before. I told you guys about that. So I jump up and I'm like, who's attacking me? What's happening? What's wrong? Why am I being awoken from my beauty sleep by unknown energies? And as soon as I tap in, I hear this is a collective attack. What? A collective attack. And I had a Lemurian come in, a Lemurian energy. I'd been working with a little bit of Lemurian energy already that month anyways. And what I heard with th is that this is a collective attack on light workers. So if you are on the spiritual path as a light worker, you've probably been feeling this. Even if you're not a light worker, but you are a sensitive, you've probably been feeling this as well. A little bit of discomfort in the air, a little bit of friction and uneasiness in the air. Just that feeling that something's not right. Maybe I should do something different. Maybe I should shift around. And under that beautiful, beautiful new moon, um, I, I even sat there like, okay, well, is this trying to teach me personally something? Is there something I need to heal, something I need to do? Because that's always my first go-to is what do I need to do to help this the peace come back? But remember that friction and uneasiness pushes us into growth. So I was told by all my guides, you don't need to do nothing. Go eat something, get some rest, and let's just let this thing ride out. So then the next morning, I'm sitting and I'm still sitting with this uneasiness, trying to figure it out. And the Lemurian energy comes in and says, this is an attack on light workers. I said, why? They said, there is frustration coming from dominating players in the industry. That means that people who are used to being dominating figures, figureheads, people in power are frustrated. There's something going on with them and that's trickling out to everyone else. And by people, by players in the industry, I asked what that meant as well. What players in the industry? And I specifically heard two things, political players in the industry and soothsayers. The Lemurian energies used the word soothsayers. I get the feeling that this had something to do with religious figureheads, um, but they used soothsayer. So I feel like this isn't just big, like mega churches and Southern Baptist pastors, that this actually goes further into even people who consider themselves spiritualists but who are on the extreme of certain powers and certain beliefs. Political players, it's an election year, so we know that there's a lot of tension going on there. And so I said, why? Why are these dominating players in the industry frustrated? And I heard for a few different reasons. The first reason I was given is a fear of power change because the collective has risen up and there is an awakening that has been taking place across the board. And all of this kind of started with feminism. When the feminists, actually, I'm gonna go back even further. This started with racism. When 
Martin Luther King and all of these other people started rising up and saying, this isn't right. They were rising against the powers that be. They were rising and standing up for ethics and for basic human rights. Everything began to change. And then the women stood up and they said, you know what? We want equal pay. We want our rights. We want to be the same as everyone else too. And so everything began to shift and change. And now we're at a place where the divine feminine collectively has begun to heal, where people are trying to embrace equality and we're stepping into that ripple. And now we have to bring that up to our figureheads. We have to hold our political leaders to the same standard that we want to hold our integrity, our personal ethics, whatever brings peace to the world. So the political leaders of the world who are still living in spaces of dominance over cer certain ethical groups, um, ethnic groups, excuse me, dominance over certain um, races of people, dominance over certain sexes of people, people in power who want to keep the choice with the power rather than with the people, rather than with the personal choice. These are the ones who are starting to get frustrated because they are sensing their own destruction. They are sensing a destruction of what they have built. And they have built this entire system, this entire hierarchy on their power. And the hierarchy that they've built is how they can get rich on the heels of others, how they can dominate certain classes, certain groups, certain races, certain sexes of people in order to maintain their power and their money. We say money because in the West, this is our breed of power. The more money you have in the West, the more power you seem to have. Even if you're not the correct choice, the more you can campaign, the more money you can throw at something, the more you can pull in people who do the same and align yourselves with other powers that be, the more group thinking seems to happen and people just gravitate there because they, the people feel unsafe. And so they're gonna gravitate towards someone who eludes power, someone who they feel like can keep them safe whether or not their personal ethics line up with that. They might even find themselves changing their per personal ethics on a subconscious level to align themselves with somebody who they feel can bring them safety because they are eluding power. No matter how fake, no matter how surface, no matter where the power come from or what kind of power it is, it's the safety. And in order to have that safety, they are unknowingly giving up their rights to be higher up in this hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. Wake in yourself to it, okay? Everyone thinks to themselves, I want more money. I would like more status. I would like to be here because this equals success. So if everyone's equal, then that means that I can't be greater than and that means I am not successful. And this is what the political powers want you to think. The political powers that be, and even these religious powers that we're talking about, these soothsayers, they are just fearing the destruction of what they've built. They're fearing the destruction of their hierarchy, which means that if their hierarchy falls, they're going to lose their status, they're going to lose their power, their influence, their money. They fear their own destruction. They don't fear the destruction of the collective, the destruction of democracy, the destruction of the people. They fear their own fall. Number two, they fear facing the truth of themselves. This is what the Lemurian told me. Because when their structure falls, when their hierarchy falls, when they don't have that influence, that power, and that money anymore, what are they left with? Themselves. They're left with themselves. And when you're left with yourself, you suddenly have to realize that your importance, that your worth has nothing to do with what you've built in society, has nothing to do with the influence that you've had. This goes for light workers too. This goes for religious figures too. 
the influence that you've had on other people, even if it's been in a positive way, has nothing to do with your personal worth. Nothing. That's simply an expression of your personal worth. So when they're left without the power and the influence, they're suddenly faced with their own powerlessness, pennilessness, um, shame, low worth, and I heard the word degrada degradation. They're left with what's under the rubble. And the only reason they built those hierarchies to begin with was because they had that sense of powerlessness and that sense of low self-worth and they wanted to be separate from that. The hierarchy is a separation ultimately from the soul self, from the divine self. And so when that falls, they're left with their own degradation. Number three, hold on, there's another message trying to come through around that. Ooh, it was just a question. Just the question came in, what am I worth? And then I heard that word penniless again. People in power who have a lot of success and a lot of influence, these dominating players in the industry, they do feel like their worth is what people will follow or what people will pay for. And their worth quite often is something that they've had to pay for also. When we're looking at campaigns, when we're looking at trying to get voters to vote for them, they're spending money. They're spending money on the commercials, they're spending money on the flyers that you get to your home, they're paying door knockers, they are spending money to get you to like them, to get you to want to follow them. And so when they're left without this hierarchy, without this mission, without this structure, when they're left with, what am I worth? If they have nothing left to spend, they don't feel that they have worth. And this is what they don't want to face. They don't want to face their own worthlessness. Not that they are worthless in reality and in spirit, but because this is how they really feel in the subconscious spaces, in their own energy spaces, because this was the thing that gave them that drive to create the hierarchy to begin with. Number three, class union. I touched on this a little bit with number one. The Lemurian, when they gave me number three, they said that what these dominating players in the industry fear is that if everyone is the same then that means that no one is separate and if no one is separate then they're no better than anyone else so this plays into number one and it plays into number two their fear of their own worthlessness and pennilessness so what we have done with creating class unions is we have created an environment of fear and we know that fear is the opposite of love, the inverted emotion of love, and that fear really creates a system where people are easily influenced. If we are in fear, then we will go to the person who exerts power and who says they can keep us safe, which means that the political people and the religious leaders know this is my crowd filled with fear. Let's give them an enemy and let me be the savior, the person who exerts dominance over the enemy, and I have created loyal followers. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if somebody is telling you you have an enemy who is a religious figurehead or who is a political person in dominance and power, there's probably like nothing to fear. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Do what you will with it, but there's nothing to fear in reality of it. I know so many people who they watch the political channels all day, people who watch religious channels and preaching all day, and they are people who are so filled with fear. It becomes overwhelming, it becomes isolating, it becomes a lot to bear 
a lot to feel responsible for in the collective because we're always fearing what's happening in the world. We're always fearing what's going to happen to us. And the reality of that is that there are bad things happening in the world, yes, but that doesn't make anyone our enemy. When we are aligned with spirit, when we are aligned with love, then we will do what it takes in love. But if we are in fear, we actually cannot do anything to change anything in the world. Nothing can be changed through a spirit of fear, nothing. Listen to it again. Nothing can be changed in a spirit of fear. Nothing. This fear environment allows people who create themselves to be special to benefit from these other people. Unity creates an environment in which no one is special because we're all one person. We're all the same. We're all in union. There's nobody special within unity. I'm the same as the people I hate. Does that make sense to someone who has fear and hate in their heart spaces? It's where we're forced to face our own self-hatred. When we have hatred in our hearts, when we feel that there are groups of people that we hate, that we dislike, that we are fearful of, or that we are better than, a lot of the time this is where we're derogatory statements, where we feel better than. We feel better than a person of this ethnicity. We feel better than a person of this sexuality. We feel better than a person of this sex, whatever it is. Anytime we place ourselves where we feel better than somebody else, we're creating and contributing to that hierarchy where we can have more worth because we've taken away somebody else's. And that's not love, it's not unity. Within unity, I'm not special. I'm the exact same as you, and you're the exact same as me, and you're the exact same as him, and her, and them, and everybody. We're all the exact same. And the problem with unity, the problem with everyone being on the same level, within the same group, within the same class, there's probably something rising up in you right now about everyone being in the same class with all the same rights, able to do all the same things. Fear comes in when we all have the exact same abilities, rights, and money. Can you imagine if you had the same amount of money as everybody else on the planet? For some of you, this might be great. And for some of you, you have a lot more to lose than everybody else. And you think to yourself, I worked hard for this. I am successful because of this. This is my way of living. This is how I wanna live. That's great. Nobody's taking away that. What we're talking about is your own sense of self-worth. Does that thing, does that money, does that job actually give you a sense of self-worth because it's separating you from other people? And when we are within unity, we have to, we're forced to look at why we have certain hatreds, why we want to be separate to begin with. And when we look at the hatreds that we have for other people, it all is going to come back to ourselves because we're all one within unity, which means that if we hold a hatred for someone else, we can go ahead and just know we're projecting that. And I really hold a hatred for myself. I really hold a hatred for what I perceive as my own weakness, my own inability to protect me, my own inability to make good choices and decisions, my own recklessness. Whatever it is inside of you, we're projecting onto other people when we need to be separate and not in a space of unity. So then I asked this Lemurian, how 
are these players in the industry creating this collective attack on light workers. And I heard that they were doing it through fear, through language, through corruption, and through greed. Essentially, there's a shadow that begins to move over the collective to blind and persuade everyone that they're helpless and need a savior. These powers that be, they are not laying in their bed at night, looking up, like Googling voodoo doctors on their phone. No disrespect to the voodoo papas, I love you guys. But they're not looking into black magic and witchcraft and saying, I'm gonna curse everybody who's against me and who rises up. They're not doing that because they actually think that they're in the right. They actually think that they are in line with what is best for everything. They are so disconnected from their own hatred, from their own fear, from themselves, that they don't even know that what they're doing is wrong. And if they do know that what they're doing is wrong, they don't think it's a sole problem. They think that's how you play the game. This is politics, right? It's just a game. Ah! Anyways. So what they're actually doing to create this collective attack is their language. They are spewing words that create the fear cloud, that create further separation. They're trying to influence with their words. They are creating the fear. They are bringing corruption. Now I say the word corrupt not loosely not loosely. Now, some people might actually be corrupt in stealing or doing unethical things behind the scenes, but when I say corruption, I mean creating that separation, tearing the world apart instead of unifying it. Why is there so much fear in unifying the world? Ask yourself that. Where do you hold your own prejudices? Where do you hold your own fears around this? And I had a conversation with someone a couple of days ago. And this someone is actually a very open-minded type person. They're fairly, um, I'd say independent, but they're fairly liberal, honestly. And they're the type of person that really helped me open up when I was younger. Because... I didn't even believe in aliens when I was in my early 20s, guys. Seriously. I was so unsafe and closed-minded. And this is one of the people who really helped break my heart open. But this same person sat there and said, I am so tired of seeing all of these people on TV and on YouTube who are just so extreme. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, I don't know. It's just like everybody is just so up in arms about everything. And they're so angry. And they think they have to protest everything. And at the time, I knew this person to be talking about like trans rights and just political things in general. And everyone was just very, the people that they're showing, not even on like Fox News, but on other stations, the people that they're showing, they just look angry. They look upset. And this was a great time for me to have a conversation about privilege and perspective. Because this person I was talking to is not a trans person, is not part of the queer community, is not part of any minor class and this person is a male by birth. So it's like this person, as open-minded as they are, had no way to perceive the daily struggles, attacks, lack of rights, and judgments that other people of certain minorities and classes receive on a daily basis. The amount of negative energy that is hurled at these people on a daily basis. On a daily basis, the queer community is attacked. On a daily basis, racial inequality is 
put out there on a daily basis there's sexism on a daily basis all of these things are happening and we're still having to lovingly move through them and this person just had no perspective to be able to perceive that because they've never gone through it all they were seeing was the anger and the ugliness of it and let me tell you what sometimes fighting for what's right and changing the collective group thinking mind looks ugly and nowhere in the bible or anywhere in my spiritual teachings does it say that love has to be pretty i i don't think love has to be pretty love can be very ugly and that's beautiful i like that a lot i like that a lot so these attacks through words through negativity through separation is rippling out across the collective and while this may not be a direct attack on the light workers specifically but more of a um, separation more of that corruption more of that greed for power it is the light workers job to balance the darkness the hatred and the separation with love and light within the collective which makes it an attack on light workers this is like that mama bear thing you attack my kid you attack me this is where light workers rise up because this attack is on our collective this attack is on the people this attack is on your country this attack is on all of the religious and political aspects do you realize that these are the parts of any society that is supposed to be the foundation the foundation of your society is supposed to be your spirituality and your leaders who keep you safe who give you rights and who make sure that everything runs orderly and right now our foundation is built on fear separation hierarchy this is an attack on our children this is an attack on the light workers light workers it's time for you to take arms take up arms we are at war war i asked the lemurian what do we do about this i understand that the people on planet earth are under attack with fear and greed and corruption which makes it my job as a light worker to do something and what the lemurian said was be not afraid be ye not afraid i was like okay bible speak you know but what the lemurian was saying was don't engage in fear do not engage with fear they didn't say don't engage they said don't engage with fear because fear is everything that they're using it is their tactic and i think that as humans we have it in our mind that we fight fire with fire but the reality is if you fight fire with fire all you have is more fire you want to fight fire with water you want to fight fire with earth you want to fight fire with something that smothers it that puts it out that transmutes it that changes its form do not engage with the fear don't pull the tools that they're pulling choose love fight for love from a place of love remember the opposite of fear is love so this lemurian very very specifically said from a place of love that means that any attack that we decide to counter with um or even if we're on the offensive rather than the defensive anything that we put in there in the religious and political spaces to counteract fear it needs to be done from our own space of love meaning we're not being fearful right now and then saying oh i need to do this back we're not being reactive okay we are sitting in a place of love understanding what love feels like what love looks like how we can project love into the world and we're taking action to awaken others and influence others to that love space 
This is how we take up arms. We take up our tools of light. We take up our tools of peace. We take up our tools of love. And how we do that, sitting in a space of love, not fear-mongering, is we use our voice, we use our heart, and we use our power. Yes, honey, we have power too. And our power is so much bigger than the power of fear. So much bigger. Because, let's go back to the children. Think about the child. If a child is coming to you, there's you and there's a child, and you do something to scare that child. The child might cry, the child might run away, but eventually the child's going to recover even if they always have an imprint and a memory of what you did. The child simply isn't going to go around you anymore. But when you have a child coming to you and you open your arms, you offer love, you offer safety, you offer all the things that they feel connected with, you offer your authenticity, your union, your oneness, your equality. When you offer what love is to that child, they will always remember that. They will always come back to you. They will always be there for you. You have earned a loyalty, a connection, a soul connection that cannot be broken or overcome. The collective even if you speak through love and it sounds more soft, even if it takes longer to create than fear does, because fear can happen in an instant, even if it doesn't seem on the surface as effective as fear, it's rippling, it's 10, 15, a thousand times stronger than fear and it's moving across the entire collective, across the entire planet. Now these extremists that this person was talking about a little bit ago, their power is to persuade our roles. So extremists aren't bad, okay? I, even myself, have gotten a little tired with extremists who become people of power because it's like if we elect someone who's extreme this way or extreme this way, it, it just feels like a lot and a lot kind of falls through the cracks and gets missed. I feel like the general person is kind of an in the middle, loving, caring kind of person. I really like gray areas, guys. I'm a big gray area fan. And according to Carolyn Miss, a rebel is part of my, um, personality archetype. So I don't particularly like to be grouped in with any particular thing. I really like gray areas because I just don't want to be so extreme in any direction that I group my mind, my thinking, my decisions based on what this thing should look like. I want to individually pick all of my decisions. So I really like gray areas. But I understand that extremists have roles in the collective. So instead of looking at the extremist as something that's ugly, scary, angry, I want us to start looking at the extremist as someone who's serving a role that we aren't serving. If we have an extremist, Someone who's yelling, who's screaming, who's marching, who's protesting, who's out there really making themselves known. They are using their voice. They are using their heart. They are using their power. And that, even though it seems so extreme, what it's doing is it has such a high energy and vibration that it begins to pull people to it. Even if people aren't pulled up here and acting as extreme as they are, they're pulling a lot of people to this side. This is like a scale. We're always looking at things as a scale. We have extremists here and we have extremists here. And the people are going to be influenced and pulled towards the extremists. And that's fine because that means that the people are gonna land somewhere here. The people are going to land somewhere in these gray areas, not here or here, 
the general population isn't going to be extreme. We're just going to be influenced and pulled towards the people who we feel like align with our beliefs. So as long as we are using our voice, then we have influence, okay? So use your voice, honey. Use your voice. Sit your heart in alignment with love, making sure that you are in love, peace, light, and then use your voice. Really get your voice out there in any little way, even if it's talking to one person, even if it's talking to yourself, because you need it. God, I need it. We all need to talk to ourselves. We should probably talk to ourselves more than we talk to other people, guys, okay? So use your voice, talk to yourself, talk to others. If you have big platforms, if you are an extremist, scream, carry on, have riots, loving riots. You know, you can lovingly overturn a car love riots. And this is our power. Our power in love is very, very strong and it ripples across the collective. And that is beautiful. Even our righteous anger is beautiful. As anything that we're doing in love to create unity and a loving space, sometimes that means that things have to be torn down. And sometimes it means we have to completely flush out and change people who are unwilling to be changed. Spaces that have been holding on to old systems of power for too long. Use your voice, come from your heart, let your power shine through. Is it possible this question came to my mind. Is it possible within gray areas, since we were talking a little bit about people falling in the gray areas, the, the areas of personal choice and change rather than being extreme while the extremists hold that specific beautiful role that they hold. And I had the question in my brain, this isn't from the Lemurian, I had a question in my personal brain. Can you follow someone while disengaging from their beliefs. We're talking about freedom of the mind because sometimes we really like a certain figure and we wanna follow a certain figure, but we don't believe every single thing that they believe. And then we end up giving up pieces of our integrity and pieces of our own power so that this person can exert their level of integrity and their power over the whole? The answer is no. You cannot follow someone while disengaging from their beliefs. But you can love someone while disengaging from their beliefs. That's important because even the people who we notice are using fear and hate tactics and greed and corruption, we still don't engage with fear and hatred. We can still love them on a spiritual level while still understanding this need for change and making it happen. Even in the religious roles, those of you who follow me, who watch my YouTube teachings, if you follow me, it's gonna be really hard for you to disengage what I believe and separate my beliefs from yours. But you can still love me and you can still get fed when you come here. You can still receive healing in alignment with your own personal beliefs. So everything is in love here. We really wanna be able to free the mind. We wanna be able to live in a space of freedom. This little reading I'm going to do is from my Druid Church of Wales. That's not what it's called, but there's, this is from a Guersu within the Bardic grade. And I'm just gonna read it from here so that you know it's not my words. But when we're looking for freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of choice, freedom of mind, being open-minded, all of the things that we're talking about here, that love, the Guersu says, Somehow we need to be able to fully and passionately identify with life becoming completely involved in it. And at the same time, be able to detach from it so that we can let go of its parade and surrender ourselves to the bliss of spirit or 
nothingness. By doing this, we discover two freedoms. We discover the freedom that comes through limitation, through accepting the boundaries that exist in our lives or in the particular medium we are working with. And we also discover the spiritual freedom that exists when we let go of our focused, mundane concerns and open ourselves to spirit or essence or God or goddess. And every Guersu within the Bardic Grave comes with a triad, which is a source of wisdom wrapped up in three strands. And for freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of the mind, what came through was the three foundations of thought. The three foundations of thought, perspicuity, amplitude, and preciseness. To develop the power of your mind and your ability to solve problems and to learn freedom, use your ability to focus on the essential in an issue. Allow your mind to magnify this and expand upon it, amplifying it in consciousness, and then open yourself to inquiry with clarity and precision. What this means is regardless of right or left, white or black, regardless of the issue, the political issue, the spiritual issue, cut through to the chase. See, what is this life lesson? What is this actually about? Is this about fear? Is this about love and unity? Is this about hatreds? Is this about justice? What is this really about? Don't get hung up in the details of specific issues. Cut to the heart, cut to the chase, what's at the core? And then focus on that and only that. Allow it to expand in your mind, to become the thing that you're focused on, that you're sending your energy to. And when you do that, it begins to take hold over the collective. Whatever you choose to truly focus your mind on, it begins to ripple out and you're suddenly given answers. You're suddenly given guidance. You're suddenly given hope and inspiration and you can see things more clearly and sometimes in a structured way where you can take steps to help bring this thing about. And sometimes this comes as more of an emotion that just ripples collectively and brings change. But you have the freedom of your mind so use your voice, honey. True to ice the fawn, all of the play and expression of soul doesn't just come through music. It comes through poetry, storytelling, all of the abstract. So today, I'm going to end by telling you a story. Kind of like a parable, where you get to decide what the meaning is, what it's is conveying through the energy. You get to decide that just for yourself. Long ago, there was a village in snowy barren fields and there were three leaders or three elders of this village. One was very sharp-witted one was very gentle and docile and one was very creative. And the three elders of this village came to a space where they realized something was off, whether this be because the climate needed to change or whether it just be because they were bored, the three elders decided to all leave together and to travel to a faraway land. And the land that they found far away across the sea was very tropical, very beautiful. And there were so many different species of fruits and vegetables and animals that they were amazed 
at the abundance of this land, of the beauty that was there, of the vivid aliveness that was there. And so one of the elders coming across a parrot, a very, very colorful parrot, decided, let us capture this creature and bring it home. It will bring us success. People will pay money to come see this creature. So we will be abundant. We will survive. We will live. And it will also bring our people joy, happiness, inspiration. Another of the elders felt it wrong to take this beautiful creature out of its home and move it to a place so cold and barren where it had no family or friends, where it didn't have the foods and the fruits that it was used to eating and feared that it would no longer sing if it was taken from its place of birth. The third elder, not being able to make up its mind either way because the third elder saw both sides of the situation. The third elder saw how the bird could suffer if the bird was taken, but how the people were suffering now and how the bird could bring hope, renewal, and joy. The third elder decided to not make a decision and to see which of the elders would simply outwit or overpower the others and he would just go with whoever won. So the first two elders began a debate and a battle back and forth that lasted three days and three nights. And on the fourth morning, one of the elders grew tired of advocating for the bird because the bird didn't seem to care either way or have any knowledge that this debate was going on. So the first elder won. And together they captured the bird, went back across the sea and back to their barren land. Here they showed the beautiful bird to the people and everyone was in awe. Everyone had thoughts and opinions. The children were joyous. Everyone was excited to see and experience this bird. Some of the people were fearful of the bird and thought it strange that a bird could speak language of people and they didn't want anything to do with the bird. So some people left the village and stopped trusting the elders. Some people were inspired by it and wrote beautiful music and poetry. The intellect grew in that space. And some people were just very indifferent and didn't have a thought or opinion either way because it didn't affect them. But the bird over time began to lose its color. Over time, the bird began to pluck its own feathers, began to lose weight. It stopped talking. It stopped speaking. It stopped singing. And there were no more secrets for the parrot to tell. And in its silence, without its luster, without its beauty, without its abundance and grace, people stopped coming to see the parrot. People stopped being inspired and joyful and everything fell back in despair the way that it was, except now the bird was also in despair. One day, the bird flies out into the village, seeking abundance, seeking change,
feeling distraught, feeling upset, feeling angry. And it descended on the first person it saw and plucked his eyes out and then flew off into the night, never to be seen again. But the people were upset. This bird, this creature, in all of its ugliness, in all of its anger, in all of its despair and destruction, it hurt somebody. And the elders were calling. They were being called forth by the people because the people were demanding consequences. The people were demanding blood. They were demanding that the bird be put to death, that the bird be punished, but the bird was nowhere to be found. So the elders decided one would go seek the bird to bring it justice. One of the elders thought that they should take responsibility for the action of the bird. And one of the elders decided that they should calm the people and have nothing to do with the bird at all. So one of the elders went out to seek the bird. While one elder stayed with the people, had many speeches, tried to calm them and distract their minds. And one of the elders sat alone in a room, feeling guilty and trying to punish himself. After nine days and nine nights, the elder who had gone to seek the bird came back empty-handed. He could not find the bird. The bird was gone. And so the people rose up against the elders, holding all three of them responsible, for all three of them had ultimately left together, found the bird together, and brought it back together. All three of them had presented this bird to the world, regardless of their personal beliefs or all of the actions and decisions it took. All three were being held responsible for the bird's actions. And so the people captured the elders, tied them up, brought them forward, and decided that they would be executed. And there were six people designated to execute the three elders. And one by one, they put the elders to death. And as the six executors sat back watching them die, all of the executors looked at the first elder as he died and knew without a doubt that they had made the correct decision. The executors looked at the second elder as he died, and they all felt sad and guilty, as if they themselves had just duplicated a crime. And all three of them looked at the third elder and didn't feel a thing. 